Well, good evening and uh, welcome to our midweek meeting for prayer and Bible study. John and I have uh, commenced a study in the first book of the Psalms. And uh, we have looked already at the first Psalm with its focus upon the law of God or the word of God. And we've looked also at the second Psalm with its uh, focus upon the Son of God, our Saviour, King and Ruler over all. And this evening we come to the third Psalm, to Psalm 3. There are, as you will notice if you glance down at the Psalm, uh, one or two new things happening here in this Psalm. First of all, it is the first of the Psalms that has a title. It's entitled the Psalm of David when he fled from Absalom his son. So that gives us a little bit of historical context for this psalm. You will also notice at the end of verse 2, verse 4 and verse 8, there is a word appears, the word Selah. And this word appears quite often uh, throughout the book of Psalms. No one is 100% clear as to what Selah means. It may be some form of, of musical term, uh, some uh, word that would indicate to the musicians uh, how they were to sing at this particular point. Maybe, I'm not sure. Uh, I personally am drawn to the idea of pause, that it means pause or interlude. Read the verses, pause, meditate, consider, reflect. So this is our psalm for this evening, Psalm 3. And before we read it together, shall we pray? Father in heaven, our gracious God, we come to you this evening in Jesus' name. And as we come to you, O Lord, we thank you again for your word. And we thank you that amidst all the changing scenes of life, that we are able to come onto that word, the word of God, the word that is sure, the word that is faithful, the word that is never changing and the word that is always a help to us in whatever situation we're in. We pray now that this psalm may touch us in our hearts and lives this evening. Come upon us, we pray, by your Holy Spirit as we consider these words in Jesus' name. Amen. Psalm 3. O Lord, how many are my foes? Many are rising against me. Many are saying of my soul, there is no salvation for him in God. But you, O Lord, are a shield about me, my glory and the lifter up of my head. I cried aloud to the Lord and he answered me from his holy hill. I lay down and slept. I woke again, for the Lord sustained me. I will not be afraid of many thousands of people who have set themselves against me all around. Arise, O Lord, save me, O my God, for you strike all my enemies on the cheek. You break the teeth of the wicked. Salvation belongs to the Lord. Your blessing be on your people. Amen. One of the wonderful things about the book of Psalms and why it is a book which the Lord's people have found to be so helpful and useful over the years is the great variety that we find within the Psalter. Psalm 1, as I've mentioned, is focusing very much on God's word, God's law and the benefits of meditating upon God's word. Psalm 2 directs us to our Saviour, the Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of God, the King and, and ruler over all, the one who is seated upon the throne. These psalms are, as it were, teaching psalms, teaching us about God and his revelation and his kingship and his authority. But here is a psalm that has a different mood, a different tone. Here in Psalm 3, the psalmist is, as it were, 
pouring out his soul before God. He's opening his heart to us. He's letting us listen in to a prayer which he is bringing unto God. In the morning time when you wake up, you at some point after you wake up, some sooner and quicker than others, throw your legs out on the side of the bed. And you probably sit, well, when you get older, you sit on the side of the bed for a few moments. The day lies out before you. As you look out into the day, at the present time, maybe you have a lot of fears and a lot of anxiety. Will I keep well? Will my family keep well? How about my work, my employment? How secure is it? How am I going to manage today? The children are off school. I'm going to try and work from home. It's a very wet day. You've been listening to the rain throughout the night. The children won't be able to get out into the back garden and, and play. Oh, granny is self-isolating. You can't call round uh, to see her in her back garden or invite her round to help with the children. How am I going to manage today? I've got a lot of fears, a lot of anxieties. Is society ever going to return to normal? Will the church ever get back to normal? Do those in high places really, really know what they're doing? Maybe you have a crisis of confidence in terms of the leadership of the nation. Many fears, many anxieties, many concerns. Well, here's a psalm for you. Because here, the psalmist, David, has a lot of concerns and a lot of fear and anxiety. I want you to notice four things about this psalm. It seems to me that it's a psalm of eight verses that divides neatly into four sections. And I want you to notice, first of all here, David's situation. David's situation. The title tells us that this psalm was written a short time after Absalom, the son of David, had led a rebellion against his father's kingship. O Lord, how many are my foes, many are rising against me. David is under pressure. There's a rebellion. He's had to flee from the palace and from the throne in Jerusalem. His life is at stake here. He is being physically threatened. A serious situation. But not only has he got anxiety and fear physically, but he's got anxiety and fear psychologically. This is his son who's rebelled against him. This is his flesh and blood who is leading an uprising and trying to seize the throne. Come now, please, try to enter into David's situation just for a moment. He's king. He has authority and power. He's been chased out of his kingdom. There's an attempt being made to remove him from the throne. And the one who's leading the rebellion is his son. Imagine the distress there would be in, in normal circumstances if it was just a sort of average normal rebel who was trying to take over the throne. But it's not. It's his son. He's got fears and anxieties, concern for his life, distress over his son. And he's got spiritual issues here as well. Many are saying, verse 2, there is no salvation for him in God. They were saying out there, ha ha, David's going the same way as Saul. God has given him up. Remember Saul, first king of Israel? Remember how the Lord departed from him? Remember how the Lord set him aside and established David in his place? Now they're saying, the wags, the critics, <laughs> David, just the same as Saul, God has given him up and God is not going to. To deliver him. And David has heard their criticisms. David has heard their cry. 
and, and think of how that must have been torturing him in his mind as well. Have I let God down? Have I failed God? I, I haven't done all that I should have done. Yes, I have engaged in, in sin and immorality and disobedience. Is God writing me off? Now, these are his problems. A concern for his life. A concern over his son, Absalom. And a concern that he's failed God and that God has written him off. His situation. But then I want you to notice, secondly, his response to this situation. Uh, and here I think we can learn a great deal from David. Because in verses 3 and 4, we see what he does in this desperate situation. We see his response to all of these pressures that have come upon him. What does he do? Well, verse 4 tells us, I cried aloud to the Lord. I cried unto God. He comes to God, recognising that God is the shield about him, that God is the one who has protected him and preserved him and kept him. Remember all those years when he was being chased around the wilderness by, by Saul? Remember those times when it looked as if Saul was going to kill him, when he was having spears flung at him. The Lord was his shield and his protector. The Lord was the lifter up of his head. The Lord was the one who had given him the position of power and authority as king over Israel. And so he cries unto God, the God who has helped him, the God who has been with him, the God who has placed him in the place of kingship. He cries unto the Lord. And it might seem a very straightforward and almost a simplistic thing to say this evening. But this is what we must do. This is what we must do. One of the great things about the Psalms, and we'll come to see this more and more, is the sheer openness of the psalmist before God. The, the fact that he is is prepared just to lay bare his soul in the presence of God, holding nothing back. There's corporate prayer when we're with others, and there's private prayer when we're alone with God. And we must, we must not hesitate when we are alone with God to openly lay out before him the burdens and the anxieties and the trials of our, our hearts. Here is the psalmist. His situation is one of great need and great anxiety. But his response to that situation is to cry unto the Lord. Brothers and sisters, you can't beat this. This is the way forward. This is what we must do, especially at this time. Cry unto God. But notice not only his situation and his response, but he shares with us in verses 5 and six, his experience. Yes, he's troubled. Yes, he's burdened. But what's happening to him? Well, he lies down at night and he, he sleeps. He sleeps. He has a peace. The Lord is sustaining me, he says. That's his experience at this particular moment in time. Although he's overwhelmed with all kinds of anxieties, he's brought them to God and God has been pleased to give to him his peace. The Lord is sustaining me. I'm able to sleep. I'm not afraid. But now this is, this is of God. This is of God. You know, you read of... Uh, men of faith in times past and the stand that they had to take for the Lord. Read uh, Reformation history and you think of someone like Martin Luther standing before uh, councils and having to give an account of his life and his faith and his doctrine, standing there alone in the, in the presence of men who are utterly opposed to him and, and want to do away with him. How can he speak with such clarity and calmness? Because God comes. 
and gives a peace. God sustains and helps in the middle of the storm. His situation is not good. His response is to cry to God. And his experience is that God is coming to him. And although around him there is turmoil, within he knows God's peace, God's sustaining grace. But then also notice fourthly here in verses 7 and 8 what I would call his confidence. His confidence. Arise, O Lord, save me, O my God. Salvation belongs to the Lord. There's a, there's a different tone here, and this is often the case with the psalmist as he comes to God in prayer. There's a different tone here. He's, he's confident that, that God is going to work. The victory belongs to the Lord. God is going to work on behalf of his people. God is the one who strikes his enemies on the tree. He breaks the teeth of the wicked. Oh, so often, so often when we come to God in prayer and lay out before God our trial, our burden and our difficulty, even in the very act of prayer, even in the very action of of bringing all of that before God. God ministers to us by his spirit and strengthens us and gives us confidence in himself. What's your anxiety tonight? What's your fear? What's your trouble? About what are you concerned? Well, there are many anxieties just now. And what are we going to do? Well, let's do what our forefathers do. Let's do what David did. Pour it out before God. Just tell him the whole thing. Hold nothing back. And I believe as we do so, that we will be able to sleep at night. For God will come to us and not instantly remove the problem. David wasn't instantly restored to Jerusalem. God will not instantly remove the problem normally, but God will give us grace and peace and strength and help. He'll sustain us, as David puts it, in the middle of it all. And as we rise from prayer, we'll rise with a new confidence, believing that our God is a great God, a God who gives victory to his people, a God who helps his people. He's the God who will bring us through. David believed that and in due time, by God's grace and with God's help, he experienced that victory.